We all come and mind a friend or two a week jam-packed with hits which sits at a fascinating point in the development of the local charts. So fire up the Peugeot 403, load up on Scooby Snacks, there's a mystery to be solved in the week ending July 3rd, 1970. In at number 10, it is the hard rock and Dutch group Shocking Blue with Mighty Joe. While Venus will always be their go-to hit, this one is pretty darn good, even if it does swipe its riff from the Everly Brothers' The Price of Love. In at 9 Tastic 9, it's the man who, two years before, sold 5% of all of the records sold in the world. Mr. Johnny Cash, with his socially conscious follow-up to the man in black, What Is Truth? Sounding like some wrathful biblical prophet, Johnny says to hell with having the biggest audience in the world, I'ma speak my truth. He was a giant, this Johnny Cash. Eight, it's the wonderful Beach Boys and their version of Lead Belly's Cotton Fields. This is their second go at it. Al Jardine produced the version on the 2020 album and felt it could be a hit with the right spit and polish. So he took it to Brian Wilson, who rejigged Al's version, speeded it up, and added some Wall of Wilson sounds to it. Bang! A number one hit in Australia, where its sunny vibes resonated. At seven is Everything is Beautiful, and therein lies a story. During my brief and undistinguished sojourn as an office worker, at one job there was a special room set aside for running photocopiers, and this was overseen by a chap called, for the purposes of this story, Wally. Wally was a large chap, but he still managed to move around his little room comfortably. Then they decided to buy the latest, flashiest, biggest, fastest copier collator on the market. This posed three problems, apart from the fact that Wally had no training whatsoever in operating the juggernaut. One, Wally could barely move around it, so there was no room for a chair, so he had to stand all day. Two, the room was completely inadequate in terms of ventilation to host such a behemoth and was always full of fumes and foul-smelling gases. And three, the machine was insufferably loud and Wally did love to listen to the radio while he worked. So, to cut a long and sad story short, Wally eventually became, not putting too fine a point on it, insane. At first, moderately so, but later, very much so. We knew this because one day people arrived at work to find that Wally had photocopied the lyrics to his favourite song, everything is beautiful and papered every square inch of the walls with them. Good sense soon prevailed thereafter and a more suitable location was found for the copier and Wally was moved to the mail room to work with his best friend Little Eddie. He gradually regained most of his senses but no one ever mentioned photocopiers in his presence again. Oh Lord, how am I going to top that? Especially given that at number six we have the one disappointment in this week's charts Everybody is Out of Town by B.J. Thomas. Now, no one's ever going to tell you that B.J. isn't a steady, reliable, warm-toned singer, but his song by Bacharach and David is just too silly to take. B.J. was about to go on to have another four top 40 hits, so it was hardly the end of the world. It's time for our latest feature, Hello and Goodbye, the records that arrived in and fell from the top 10 this week. Two in this week, Cotton Fields up by five from 13 to eight, and Mighty Joe up nine from 19 to 10. Next week's number one is at 16 this week, which means nothing in the digital world, but back when, 16 places was enormous, especially to take on a well-established and big-selling number one. And of course, two out, a really cool record, The Rapper by The Jaggers, went down from three to 17, and Great Big Bundle of Love by Brenton Wood, which fell from number five to clean off the charts. Why such massive drops? Hmm, pretty mysterious. There is a reason, and we'll talk about this after the fantastic facts. At five, we have an X six week number one, the biggest hit of the year and the 84th biggest hit of all time in this town. It's perched there right between You Shook Me All Night Long and Crocodile Rock. Norman Greenbaum's Spirit in the Sky. A record that sounds like it was cut on a Radio Shack tape recorder at the back of a bowling alley. Nevertheless, the combination of the then fashionable Jesus-iness and a fuzz box proved, and still prove, irresistible. In a really useless piece of trivia, on my hometown charts, this is the 10th, believe it or not, highest placed record by an artist who never had another hit. And I bloody love it. 
At four is Cecilia by Simon and Garfunkel from their uber successful Bridge Over Troubled Water album, which spent 15 weeks on top of the charts, but not this week. It's a pleasant, jaunty enough song that's not going to cause you to flip your radio station when it comes on, and equally, you won't crash your car into a ditch because you were so spellbound by it. Three is one of the songs that everyone who was around in 1970 remembers, some of us warmly, some of us with a flash of embarrassment. It's professional hippie Hans Paulson and his pain to love and rustification, the tuneful boom sha la la lo Eh, Rick Springfield was better. Two is equally one of those songs that engenders either guilty pleasure or embarrassment. In this case, generally much more the latter than the former. Tennessee Birdwalk by Jack Blanchard and Misty Morgan. I'm in the guilty pleasure camp. I like this silly little song and I find it quite enjoyable. We've had full-time fact-checkers foraging through the frivolous and forthright facts on hand this week. They were all fact-checked kind of true and thus we offer Fowl's fantastic world of facts. Biggest riser this week is Up Around the Bend by CCR, although I suspect the B-side run through the jungle may have had something to do with brisk sales, sending it rocketing 14 places upward this week. Biggest faller is noted rapscallion and misleader of Beatles, Harry Nilsson, who's everybody talking, suddenly no one is talking about, and it drops nine spots to number 24. The longest lasting song on the charts is Spirit in the Sky, which has been sitting there for 14 weeks. Now, this week, there were only four records that had lasted more than 10 weeks on the chart. The average length of stay on the charts was just a shade over five weeks. There were four debutantes, the highest of which was Bobby Goldsborough's Can You Feel It in at 25. The longest run any song in the top 10 this week would have was 16 weeks which, compared to a year before and a year after, is very low. How is it that songs like Brenton Wood's Great Big Bundle of Love at Five and Rising vanished from the charts altogether? And finally, why after 10 years of being a top 40, do we go to a top 30? There is a reason, and long-running and keen-eared viewers of this channel will know why. For the chart week commencing 22nd of May 1970, the Notorious Radio Band came into place. The band came about because the Australian Performing Rights Association wanted a better rate of royalties paid by record companies and more local acts played on the radio. For some reason, the radio stations agreed, so suddenly every British and European record disappeared from the charts. It's not that they weren't selling, they just weren't getting played on the radio, unless the DJ really liked the record or someone slipped them some payola. I mean, you're not going to stop playing Beatles records a month after the band breaks up, knowing full well that your rival on the 7 to 10 shift at the next station on the dial is. But they didn't get published on official station top 40 listings. American labels seemed to go along with this somewhat more and were much less affected. For IP, and I was generally a 4IP listener, except for a spell in the mid-70s when I listened to 4BK, but went back to 4IP because 4BK wouldn't stop playing Lion Eyes by the Eagles. And a spot in the late 70s where I listened to 4BC up until drive time ended, then 4BK into the wee hours because they played weird music. Moved to a top 30 because they wanted quality of records on their playlists, not quantity. There was no chart for 22nd of March, but on the 1st, post radio band chart the following records simply disappeared love grows where my rosemary goes little green bag a baby loves lovin let it be instant karma knock knock who's there by mary hopkin come and get it by bad finger and another Mary Hopkins hit, Tema Harbour. Note the Mary Hopkins version of Knock Knock Who's There got wiped out. This becomes relevant later. The radio band lasted until October 1970. 
Anyway, enough of our troubles. In the USA, the number one record was The Love You Saved by the Jackson 5, and in England, it was In the Summertime by Mungo Jerry, which sold in unaccounted numbers around the world, except in Australia, where a cover version by The Mixtures spent seven weeks at number one. And the top album in town was Deja Vu by Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, which the pretend hippies no doubt played at their pot parties, pill fiestas, or heroin jamborees, or whatever hippies did then. When I worked at that job where Wally ran the copy room, I not only met the future foul queen, but another lifelong friend, Monty the safety monkey. I witnessed his rise and fall, and I know where they dumped his body, in a big puddle in the corner of the car park under 340 George Street. But through the miracle of technology, he is here today to drum you in the number one hit for this week. Go on, Monty, avenge your murder in rhythm. This week's number one is a cover of Mary Hopkins's Knock Knock Who's There by the sadly under-remembered Liv Mason. Liv, who had a not unlike Karen Carpenter contralto and absolutely soaked up the television camera, was the first Australian woman to earn a gold record, but follow-up hits to Knock Knock were thin on the ground. It's also said she wasn't comfortable with the sudden attention. She was a suburban mother of two who won a televised talent contest in 1969 and expected just to make some pocket money singing jingles, but all of a sudden, with all of the Euro acts knocked off the chart, there were a plethora of great songs to be picked up by the local act. And Mason's Knock Knock Who's There was better than Mary Hopkins's version. Her deep voice making it sound smoky and alluring. A worthy number one for sure, but history tends to count it down because of the way it came to be. Well, that has got to have been the longest edition we've ever done. I do apologise if I've overstayed my welcome like some couch-surfing stoner friend who you've really moved on from because now you're married, you have a new baby and a house full of Ikea stuff that you paid to have assembled by professionals. But I do hope that I can somehow recover in your collective good graces and we will once again meet sometime in the future in that country most foreign, the past. 